Hello, welcome back to the video series for Geography 300 Geographical Data Analysis for WVU. Our last um, video here on this set of spatial regression, spatial lag and spatial error, is about presentation of the data. So again, getting to those conventions. So the first thing is what would we put into, well, actually the first thing would be how do we justify that choice? So we first we need to justify the choice of method. So we need to be able to say, I picked, I did went and did a spatial lag regression with clean contiguity because of XYZ. Now especially justifying the use of spatial lag in the first place, we'll almost always start with showing the ordinary least squares regression and the Moran die of its residuals. That gives us the ammunition, that, so to speak, or justification for why we would need a spatial regression model in the first place. Then I can, once I have made that case, I can then appeal to, as I said, some outside process to say, with COVID, as an infectious disease, I expect the high rates here to be related to a high rate in the neighboring counties. Therefore, I am using a spatial lag model with, because of that choice with neighboring counties, with a queen contiguity matrix. As I said, you could make other choices. You could choose a spatial error regression because you think there's other issues going on, like the vaccination rate. You could justify a 50 or 70 kilometer uh, distance threshold based upon um, based upon driving patterns. So there are other justifications and other choices you can make than what I am using here or what I would personally choose. To repeat, as long as you can justify your choice well, you will get credit and it will be okay. So we have that justification. Now we move into what do I present in the results. As with so much we have seen, the software will give you a ton of data. Most of it is overkill for the kind of uh, presentations that we would be doing. So again, we can start with the OLS. you would not have to follow this exact structure. This is something I've seen a fair amount in, um, in some of the scientific literature, scientific articles that I read. And I think it's a good, concise way of presenting the results. Remember, and there's one other thing here, The order of these may be flipped. But remember from OLS, we had the intercept, 
the coefficient, the r squared, the, and now we've added the Morant eye of the residuals. We can, and we want both the value and the p-value under the null hypothesis. Now that gets the null hypothesis for the intercept was that it was zero. We may or may not involve that in the discussion. It depends on whether or not it actually matters what the intercept is. Coefficient. Again, the null hypothesis, it's zero. There's no relationship. And we have the p-value telling us how likely it is that that null hypothesis is supported by the data. We have our squared. It's the overall relationship. And again, the p-value to go along with that. Then we have the Morant eye of the residuals. The null hypothesis being that there is... Um, no spatial autocorrelation, what's the p-value? Is that significant? Is there then a good chance that the data says yes, there actually is a relationship going on here? Once we have that, then we can go and present our spatial lag or error results. And I'll put here, sometimes, again, it can be rearranged. We had that additional coefficient of the spatial lag term of the neighbor's average value. Now the same applies for lambda if we're using spatial error. So is so then we go and we we still have our intercept. And we give the number, the value of the intercept and its associated p value. Same for the coefficient. We can still run Moranti on the residuals. In this case, we would probably hope that those are not significantly autocorrelated anymore. It's something that we really kind of hoped we had addressed by doing, by doing this, by doing a spatial lag or a spatial error regression. But we can double check to make sure that it is indeed no longer significant for the autocorrelation of the residuals of our new spatial regression. We will get an R squared value that now accounts for the overall relationship accounting for both the coefficient and this lag coefficient or rho term here. So now there's two, two different coefficients combining for this overall relationship. And we can still say, is that overall relationship a good explanation between both the coefficient and the lag term? Do they combine to give a good explanation of what's going on with the dependent variable? That R squared, if R squared is high with a low P value, then together they do they give a good explanation. That can happen even if by themselves neither of them is that great. So we can now have a situation where this might be a P value of 0.11. Our row, again, we get a number. We get a p-value. And I'll get to the interpretation here shortly. Again, this p-value might be 0.12. By themselves, neither of them would say, we would say even at a 0.1 threshold, that they are by themselves significantly related. 
but together they may still give an R squared. That's a better justification, a better explanation for better prediction collectively with both of those and have this be 0.04, even though the two individual components were 0.11. So we can now have a situation where one part of our explanation, one part of our regression equation is okay, but not that great. And another part is okay, but not that great by itself, but together they work well. That is a dynamic that we will look at in even more detail next week. And that's how we can interpret this R squared and its associated p-value. So now we have this lag term and it has a p-value. So that p-value, what happens? Okay, again, our null hypothesis that there is no effect from one place to its neighbors. No effect would mean rho is equal to zero. So in that case, it is behaving just the same as our coefficient here, and it gets interpreted in much the same way. If our coefficient is not significant, then we say that independent variable didn't really have a strong effect on the dependent variable. If this is not significant, then we would say that's the null hypothesis, that the neighboring values of the dependent variable don't really have much effect on the value of the dependent variable here. If it is significant, if that p-value is low, then it's the reverse. The higher the average dependent variable on the neighbors, we have a higher dependent variable here. So now we then this is kind of a, a convention for presenting the results table. Now we go to discussion. What conventions and trouble spots do we have there? So there are two main things with the interpretation that would be going on here. The first, especially if you're writing for a general audience, spatial lag regression is not as well known. And so you're going to have to make sure that you interpret and you say this spatial lag term, it was significant. Here is what that means. It means that a high COVID rate here is leading to a high COVID rate in neighboring counties. And that there is that infectious disease spillover going on. And we would do the same if it was a lambda coefficient for a spatial error model. That we would interpret and say there is something else going on. There is some other factor leading to the errors in the OLS regression, being spatially autocorrelated, being related to one another across space. And so there is this other process that, again, we don't know for certain what it is, but it's represented by the spatial error term. And we can say that something else is going on, something else creates a spatial pattern. And it's important, it's significant, that lambda value has a low p-value. Also, when you, especially if you're using this structure, the reader is going to be drawn to comparing, okay, what's different between these two? Is the coefficient significant in one but not the other? What might that mean? You'll need to interpret that coefficient and interpret the difference in coefficients. If it's relevant, interpret the difference in intercepts. Interpret 
how much the R squared changed by adding this spatial term. Interpret the difference, what we would like to see is in the ideal world, which may or may not exist. That comparison in the ideal world, we would hope that the intercept, if it's important, doesn't change that much. The coefficient, again, doesn't change that much. We would like to see this spatial lag or spatial error term be significant, be high, and with a low p-value. And the r-squared value goes up a lot. If the r-squared value goes up from the ordinary to the spatial, then we can say with confidence that, yes, adding this spatial term made a difference. It made our predictions better. It made our regression model better. And the Morant I residuals, or of the residuals, was significant here, but not here, not for the spatial regression model, because we would like to say our spatial regression took care of that problem. And so in the ideal world, we can go and say, look, the, the Morant I, there, there is spatial and a correlation of the residuals of the errors in the ordinary regression, but not in the spatial regression. That again reinforces this statement, this idea that our spatial regression was useful, was better, and helped in understanding the processes that we are trying to learn more about. Then the interesting thing and potential trouble spots, what happens if that ideal world doesn't happen? If this is not significant, if this is still significant for the Moran's I, the residuals, if R squared doesn't change. Okay, in that case, it turns out our choice of spatial model, spatial regression didn't work out too well. So maybe in that case, we say, okay, it didn't work out for spatial lag, let me try spatial error, or vice versa. That could also be a reason to say, you know, maybe it's actually the situation that would lead us to take geographically weighted regression, as we'll see next week. So, if our results are not ideal, we might then suggest the next step. Maybe we can speculate as to why they were not ideal. Another thing could be a coefficient that was significant for OLS is not for spatial lag. And what that means is what we saw in our coefficient as something that was an important relationship, that independent variable was really just kind of standing in as what's called a proxy or as a represent to represent the um, spatial lag term. So it wasn't mass compliance after all. It was actually the neighboring infection rate of COVID that was really driving what's going on in the county. And if we hadn't looked at the neighbor's rates, then we would see that, then, then we would have assumed, okay, it was the mass compliance, but really once we're bringing this additional information, that was, a, that was incorrect. That's again something that can happen as we bring in more information to our regression model. We will see that again going into next week, where, our re where the results can change as we bring in new information and additional information. And that can, that can change our output, that can change our results, and that therefore changes our discussion and our interpretation. As I said, in the ideal world, our new information always just makes things better. But it doesn't always happen in reality. So those are the main presentation issues. Justify your choice. Again, present just what is needed. And make sure you interpret everything that the reader needs to know. And make sure that your assumptions 
about what the reader knows coming in, and that knowledge they are bringing in is represented in your writing. So don't assume they know what spatial lag means. You'll have to explain that. You'll have to justify and interpret what does that new coefficient, rho or lambda, what does it mean? Tell the reader. Don't assume they know how to read that table the way you would know how to read that table. So those are the presentation tips for presenting spatial regression here. As always, if you have questions, feel free to ask in class. Feel free to send me an email. Um, and thank you for watching. Have a good one. I'll see you at the next set of videos of, as our third and final focus on regressions.